without any further ado, no one should escape because now it's time for the Science Slam. And for that, I hand over to Helena Hartmann, who has organized this and will also be moderating this great event. Thank you. I'm just going to wait until the slides appear, but I can start already. I want to talk about science communication now. We've heard a lot of talks, a lot of science, maybe the brains are already smoking, but uh, in reality, what we're going to do now in the next hour might be even a little bit more difficult than that. So science communication is talking to the general public, for example, at events like the Long Night of Research, but it can also be talking to a stranger on the train or even to your grandparents over coffee and cake, as we do that in Germany. Um, and that can be a very daunting endeavor, but we do have people who are not scientists who are interested in what we do. But they will not necessarily just go online, look for your newest publication, and then also understand what you did. So we need scientists who are willing to take this plunge and explain their research to people who have no idea about it. And today, I'm very proud to announce that we have seven people who are going to jump in the cold water and try that. So I think that's already worth a big applause. <clears throat> and we start with the first slam right away. Uh, I'm going to show one more slide. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> uh, just some ground rules for this whole thing. Can we go one slide back? Sorry. <laughs> Basically, we have seven slammers. I didn't give them any rules whatsoever, so they can do whatever they want on stage. They have four minutes each, and then we have a few minutes time for, times for questions. And I want you to keep in mind all of these talks, because at the end, there will be a voting for the best science slammer, actually the best three, and then those will get prizes on Saturday in the closing ceremony. So please think about which presentation you like the most. So now, without further ado, we start with the first slammer, which is Livia Azan from University Hospital Essen. She's a resident in neurology, which she told me was important to tell you, and I guess you will find out why. And I think she will answer the question, can we find the right words to tell people about side effects? Thank you, Helena. So, let's start with a simple truth. Doctors' visits are scary. Two out of five people say that they are anxious before a doctor's appointment. And 70% say that they are concerned that they won't get the terminology that the clinician uses in front of them. So, words matter, especially in a scenario which is by default scary already. So for this talk today, I asked artificial intelligence to help me and transform phrases that doctors routinely say in their everyday practice into pictures. And now keep in mind that these pictures might be the one picture that your patient imaginates as well. So let's try this out. Hi, I'm your radiologist. So we need to perform a CT scan on you. And the way this works basically is we cut you into thin slices to have a good look at your organs. What does the AI see? Oh well, okay, that's, that's horrific. I mean, clearly he has good intentions, look at his face, but um, just imagine being butchered by your radiologist. Uh, not a good view. Next scenario. You want to draw blood from your patient and you want to announce the cannula. So you say, okay, beware, now comes the sting. So uh, having a bee sting as an announcement probably is also not the best way to imagine it. Now a different scenario. Your genetic risk profile shows that you are a high-risk patient. So your patient will feel convicted by her genetic predisposition, helpless and um, doomed, basically. And interestingly enough, it has been shown in a study that knowing your own genetic risk already leads to a negative influence in behavior and physiology even. But most importantly, 
for us as clinicians is this dilemma that we face with the informed consent conundrum. We do want to inform our patients about side effects of drugs or medical procedures, but we do know that by doing so, we elicit nocebo effects. And now I want to show you how we want to tackle this problem in the University Hospital uh, Medicine in Essen in our neurology department in a study. Lumbar punctures are a routine diagnostic procedure in neurology, and it's basically done by tapping the spinal canal of a patient with a thin needle and then collecting drops of cerebrospinal fluid to investigate it. One possible side effect is headache. An ethically a bit questionable study from 1981 showed that if the doctor does not inform the patient about the side effect at all, nearly no patient develops headache. But if you tell them about this risk, nearly half of the patients experienced headache. Now, in our study, we, of course, do not want to hide information from our patients. So what do we do? We randomize patients that have an indication for a lumbar puncture into two groups. One group is the treatment as usual group, and there the patient receives the standard wording in the informed consent procedure, where it's practiced pretty much everywhere. And then we have the experimental group, where we will enhance this informed consent procedure by using evidence-based communication strategies that have been shown to actively reduce nocebo effects. And after this, of course, the lumbar puncture is performed, and then the patients are asked for headache amongst other things afterwards. Our goal with this is to show that words can actually work wonders and that we can improve the health outcome ultimately to the benefit of our patients. Thank you very much. Thanks, Livia. We have a few minutes time for questions. I have one while people start thinking about questions. So if we know about this, or at least start to know about this, why is not every practitioner doing this already? And why is there still standard sentences if they are not the right ones? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I think it's just a bit uh, the lack of knowledge in our field as a practitioner. So I think there's no good guidance for us. Um, we are not taught this well in medical school, so education is a huge problem. But I think we should also back these things up with actual evidence. So this is one first ever effort to do this in a real-world clinical mm -hmm. scenario and to just prove black on white that it works, actually. And I hope that we will achieve that, of course. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? So. Hi, Livia. Um, great side slam. Um, thank you for that. Um, I just have a basic question regarding uh, the side effects. When exactly do you ask them? Mm -hmm. um, is it directly after the puncture or um, do you wait until they cannot develop the side effects anymore? Yeah, so at different time points. Um, earliest time point being three hours after lumbar puncture, 24 hours after lumbar puncture, 72 hours later, and we were advised also to phone them three months later, because sometimes things like lumbar punctures, so actually harmless procedures, could be rise for actually a chronic uh, headache. And um, we have an expert um, in our university hospital with Dagny Holly and she said it would be wise to also include this long-term thing. Exactly, and it's known that uh, post-puncture headache um, occurs within five days, so we pretty much, um, or 99% happen within five days, so we, we get them all. Okay, thank you, Livia. Thanks. <laughs> okay, without further ado, we come already to the second science slammer of the evening, and we're gonna stay with the positive words. Uh, we know already that the what to, what to say now, but uh, let's stay for, with that for a moment and think about how to frame certain things. And our next speaker is Kari Libovitz from Stanford University, that's at least where she did what she's going to present today, and I'm really looking forward to your slam. Thanks. Hi everyone, so Helena set me up kind of perfectly because I figured we're in Germany and we're all friends here, so why not just talk to you about my research over a beer? 
Also, my priors tell me that beer makes me funnier. So, this morning, you heard from my friend Lauren Heathcote, ooh, who gave that gorgeous talk about describing side effects as positive signals with the COVID vaccine. But I want to tell you the story of the first time we tested that approach. So this was a project that we did in the Stanford Mind and Body Lab with my mentor, Ali Crum, uh, led by my friend Lauren Howe. And basically, we had learned about this wild treatment for food allergies that they were doing at the Stanford Allergy Center. It's called oral immunotherapy. And basically, they take people who are super, super, like, deadly allergic to peanuts or whatever, and they give them teeny tiny doses of their allergen, and they increase the size of those doses over time until they build up desensitization. And then if these people keep taking their doses, basically, they're not allergic anymore. But the problem is that a lot of these patients are kids and their families, and it's really scary for them because sometimes they have side effects like maybe hives or nausea, and these side effects aren't actually dangerous, but they make families really nervous. But our colleagues in the allergy center were telling us that actually these side effects can be thought of as a good sign, that there's evidence that these side effects are a signal that the body is actually building desensitization and that the treatment is working. And we were like, um, these patients probably don't know this, right? So when they have side effects, they're probably like, what does it mean? Like, are my allergies really bad? Is the treatment not working for me? And so we were like, what if we just told them that these side effects were a positive signal that the treatment was working, you know? And so that's what we did. It was this huge study. We recruited 50 kids and their families, and we put them through six months of oral immunotherapy treatment. And so we had the sort of control group that we would think of as treatment as usual, and when they had side effects, we were basically like, that sucks, like, sorry, you're not feeling good. But when we had kids in the intervention group and they had side effects, we'd be like, sorry, you're not feeling good, but like, actually, that's a good sign. It means the treatment is working. It means your body's getting stronger, building up desensitization to peanuts. You you know, like when you go to the gym and you have a hard workout and your muscles are sore, but you're getting stronger. And I should be clear, we gave both groups the same exact oral immunotherapy treatment, the same information for safety purposes about what serious side effects to look out for. The only difference between the two groups was how we described the meaning of these minor, not dangerous side effects. And it fucking worked. Like, basically every metric that we looked at was improved by this intervention. So when they did have side effects, kids and their families were less worried about them. They were less likely to call us clinic staff with questions about side effects. At the largest dose sizes, when they were eating the most peanuts, they actually had fewer symptoms. And the craziest finding was we looked at this blood biomarker called peanut blood IgG4, and past research shows that a higher prevalence of this biomarker means more allergic tolerance and desensitization, and the kids in the intervention group actually had a higher amount of this protein, of this biomarker, in their blood, which suggests that just changing the way that we talk to them about side effects actually improved their physiology and the way that the treatment worked. And like, to me, this is just so crazy and exciting because there is so much potential to improve our healthcare treatments this way, you know? Like, we're spending a gazillion dollars a year, like, trying to develop new drugs and match our drugs to our genotypes. And like, yeah, all that is great, but like, we're totally sleeping on the possibility of our existing treatments and their full potential because we're not taking into account people's mindsets and the meanings that they're making as they're going through treatment. And so what we really need to be do is we, we really need to be focusing on these mindsets and understanding what these patients are thinking to make treatments maximally effective and to get the most out of the medications that we're giving people. So I could rant about this all day, but I think I'm cut off now, and we can always chat about it more later over another beer, and I'm happy to take a couple questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions for Kari? I just have one. Can you please call all the practices and just tell them exactly what yeah. you just told us? <laughs> this I think is my that would be great. Once you get me going, so it's well practiced. We have a question here. Yeah, thanks. First, that was great. Um, I was just wondering, how did the kids react when you told them that this is actually good? Were they 
very happy to believe that or skeptical? Yeah, so the message was really embedded into the whole treatment. So it wasn't seen as anything different or anything unusual. We were just explaining, here's how you take your doses, you know, here's how the treatment works, here's what to think about side effects. And so the kids in our intervention condition, they totally just really held on to that. I have like amazing cute videos of little kids being like, when you have a, a symptom, it, it actually means your body is fighting off peanuts. And like, it was beautiful <laughs> and the manipulation check worked and like, they really just accepted that and so did the parents. Another question. How has your research affected the practice at the clinic? Have the clinicians actually changed how they um, give the allergens and how they instruct the Kids. Yeah, so it's a good question. I think that it's not sort of systematic, but the people who were involved in the study and the leadership at this level, I think it has trickled into their practice and how they talk to people. And actually, I have like a childhood friend whose mom is an allergist who read our paper and now she does this with like her allergy patients in Ocean Township, New Jersey. And so like it's slowly sort of getting out there and I'd love to see it become part of the standard oral immunotherapy way that symptoms are described. Great. I think that's worth a big applause. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> ah, that's okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> okay, let's now move on to something that is maybe a bit unusual as a combination, psychedelics and psychotherapy. Maybe to the people who research this, it's not so unusual, and I hope that the next slammer can tell us a little bit more about this. Next up, we have Lukas Basedo from Philips University Marburg, who will answer the question, what can psychedelic drugs teach us about placebo-controlled trials? Thanks. All right, so I have to start off with a little confession. Actually, I'm not going to show you any science or data. This is more of an advertisement talk, so <laughs> please forgive me. Um, I also have to admit that in the last years, whenever I talked about psychedelics to people, and I talked to a lot of people, everybody who wants to listen, some people who don't want to listen, um, but every time I talk to people, I'm not very objective, I'm not very scientific, I don't really have like on my dissertation cap or something like that. What I have on when I talk to people are rose-colored glasses. And if I wear these, I get excited. These are my excitement glasses, and I talk about synergies, opportunities, revolution, changing the world, changing everything, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing for a lot, for a lot of years, basically. But in the last, let's say, 12 to 24 months, I've come to the decision that I think it's time to retire these, actually. <laughs> because if you have looked at trials of psychedelics, especially randomized controlled trials, there's one major issue that everybody notices, and especially you would notice as placebo researchers, which is everybody knows when they've taken a psychedelic. <laughs> like, there's no, like, literally no blinding possible, at least with, like, normal dosages. Microdosing is another topic. Um, but everybody knows. There's, like, one study that came out last week where they actually did something really cool. You can ask me about it later. But I think that's the first study that managed to do blinding. And it never works, basically. Um, so... Now, you might be asking why I'm telling you this. Like, why is this guy talking about his weird obsession with drugs? Uh, <laughs> because I think you are the perfect audience for this. You are the perfect collaborators for psychedelic researchers. Everybody on Twitter who is into psychedelics nowadays talks about one thing, expectation effects. They are discovering the placebo effect in you, and everybody is like, I don't know what's happening here. Like, expectation seems to drive a lot of effects. Very interesting. And <laughs> seeing this as someone who is like in the placebo field, I think there's a huge opportunity to collaborate. So that's actually what I want to do with this talk, to inspire you to work on psychedelics as a topic, because not only can you help to make psychedelic research actually good, <laughs> or better, let's say, um, I think there's also some aspects that we, as placebo researchers, can learn from psychedelic drugs. I think the first is 
the importance of good trial design and looking at blinding and assessing if our trials actually work and if everything works. And the second is the huge influence of context, of setting, of set and setting, as Tim Riri said. So we've seen some talks actually about this already, some slams, that the communication matters, the situation in which you treat people and how you deal with that set and that setting is absolutely important. And that's something that's very, very obvious in psychedelic studies, where they take a lot of effort to design nice settings that everybody is very kind and supportive. And this is something that we should focus on more, and I think that's something we can actually learn from the psychedelic field. But to close off, I just want to say again, to inspire you to help make psychedelic research better, and help me to get my glasses back on if I find them. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. We have a question. So thanks for sharing uh, your love for drugs. But I have a question. I was thinking of how do you, you, you said there's a study that could blind psychedelics. How can you do that? <laughs> uh, well, they're very smart. It's actually from Stanford. What they did was they put people under anesthesia and then they gave them ketamine. <laughs> so uh, that's basically the one way to do it. Like nobody notices the intervention. Uh, and interestingly, so there's no difference to the placebo group, where they didn't give them any, like just the normal anesthesia, but both groups had like a major antidepressive effect, actually. So I think that's another very important lesson from psychedelic trials, is that sometimes it's not so much about the intervention itself, but about the context of the intervention and about the whole ritual around it. Like in a psychedelic trial, it's, you don't go to psychotherapy, you get a preparation session to prepare for the big event coming up. Then there's a big event happening with two therapists sitting with you in a room with music and everybody talks about how important it is. And then the next day, again, you talk to someone about it. So, and I think that these setting effects are a major driver of the actual treatment effects that we see. And I think this study shows that beautifully because they don't know, obviously, that they've gotten ketamine and the one group didn't get any antidepressant, but they still showed a major antidepressive effect. And I believe it's partly due to the big thing of surgery or like anesthesia that happened in that case. Um, so yeah, they kind of managed to do it, but it's not like a viable way for practice or <laughs> any issue, yeah. Another question. The, um, it, what you report with anesthesia also happened with trials of electroconvulsive treatment, that a massively impressive procedure like that, there was very little difference in the 1980 Medical Research Council trial whether they pushed the button or not. But I wonder if one way of doing a blinded study is to give different types of psychedelic. It seems to me there are two theories. One is that if you give people an amazing psych psychedelic experience, it distracts their minds from their ghastly marriages and awful jobs and so forth, which is what most people complain about. Um, the other theory is that the specific chemical involved does things to specific bits of the brain. Uh, so if you gave some people ayahuasca, other people psilocybin, ketamine, maybe that would act as a a suitable comparator. Do you think that would be possible? Has it been done? Um, so it's actually really hard. Like people try to do active placebo controls, but like using other drugs doesn't really work. There's one study where they use DXM, uh, which you might know if you take it in large dosages, you also get hallucinations, different from psychedelic hallucinations, but still <coughs> impressive subjective effects. And I still think 95% knew when they got psilocybin and didn't even uh, like notice that they like they knew they got psilocybin, and so finding an active control is really hard because what you want is a control that has the same subjective subjective effects, but supposedly no psychological benefit because you want to compare to something that feels the same but doesn't have the treatment effect, and I don't think that's possible. Like you can compare two different psychedelics, I think that's a great idea, 
I don't think anybody has done it yet. I think everybody should do it, like take ketamine, MDMA, and psilocybin, for example, three-arm study. Absolutely a good idea. But it won't show you that psychedelics uh, work better than other treatments. Like, they don't have a comparator, really, right? You can compare these three substances, and maybe psilocybin works better than ketamine uh, or MDMA. Um, but, like, the point of the active control is to show there's actually something happening that's specific to the substance, and you can't have a psychologically disturbing effect without probably having also a benefit to it in that sense. So it's cool, we should do it, but I don't think it's going to tell us what we want to know. Okay. Just making sure there are no children in the audience, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lucas. <laughs> So I just talked about empathy pain. Maybe some of you are still feeling pain from the noises. Um, maybe you're thinking, well, it's already the evening. I think I deserve a glass of wine, or maybe two. So I think this is the perfect introduction for the next speaker, Elif Kaliskan from the University Hospital Essen here. And she will tell us what marketing and advertising with wine bottles have to do with placebo effects in medicine. Um, I have to have this one too. So, hello everyone, my name is Elif Busec Kaliskan. I'm quite new to the area actually, and at the very beginning, my hobby helped me quite a lot to understand what my research area was at all. And today I'm going to talk about placebo effects in wine, right? Let's go to a restaurant environment. You're going to order some wine. You have the menu at your hand. And the question, the first question is actually the price, isn't it? So you see the price of the wine, and it has already a substantial effect on your expectations. So the participants in an experiment who saw, so they had the same wine in different bottles with different labels and different pricings, and they found the more expensive wine much more agreeable, actually. And they would buy it more often. Um, then you come to the aroma profiles in the wine. So that is general aroma profiles of basic wine types. If you look at closely to red and white wines, by the red wines you see mostly red fruits, by the white wines mostly yellow fruits. It's very congruent with the color of the wine. And the Fra French did a mischievous experiment in the 80s. They colored a white wine. Uh, it was a classic Bordeaux blend with Sauvignon Blanc in, uh, and uh, Sémillon. And they asked the participants to describe the wine. And actually, the participants described the wine, the colored wine with red wine characteristics, like jam, red fruits, pepper. And the second thing you see is actually also the glass, which is why I brought my glasses from home. Uh, this is my tasting glass which is a universal glass. You can taste everything with that. So from whiskey to beer to wine, what you get at the restaurant is actually something mouth-blown. It's special for your uh, experience with the glass. It's made for red wine. It's one of a kind because it's handmade. And you also have expectations through the vessel of the wine, right? And then comes your sommelier. He already asked about your preferences, previous preferences about the wine. So he recommended some wine according to your preferences. And now he tells you about the wine itself, how it was produced, which traditions are behind the wine, or um, which grape types, which uh, flavor specifics, and um, if it's bottle age, if it's oak barrel age. So you have already so many expectations before you taste the wine, actually. And then comes the contextual factors. So when you go back to the restaurant environment, the music at the, uh, um, at the background has a substantial effect on your tasting experience. And the studies show that some music types enhance some flavor profiles. For example, interestingly, white wine goes better with Mozart, 
red wine with Tchaikovsky. Um, nobody knows why. And the lightning at the background, if you taste the red wine with the red lightning, you perceive the wine much more fruitier, much more intense, much more pleasant. Under green lightning, though, it becomes le uh, fresher and less intense. And that makes me think about our research area, actually. When you think about medicine, all of these contextual factors that I mentioned, they exist in the hospital as well, you can change the color of the pills to background noise, I would call, not music at the hospital. Anyway, <laughs> um, you can use all these factors in order to modulate the treatment expectations of the patients as well. And we have a much more of a challenge in comparison to the sommeliers because the patients don't come to celebrate to the hospital. They come with their anxieties, they come with their bad previous experiences, they come with their dysfunctional beliefs. And that is why we have to... Um, pay attention to these details much more in comparison to the sommeliers. And there I come to our research area at Bingle Lab, and I cheers to you for listening to me. <laughs> Questions for Elif. I'm just wondering if we should all do a sommelier training now as researchers in the, in the hospital, might be good. When you're interested in that, there are multiple uh, <laughs> certification programs. I have a very proud intermediate wine certificate. I'm planning to take the advanced <laughs> exam as well. But uh, I must say it has lots to do with placebo research, marketing, has already um, investigated most, most of the things that we are investigated right, investigating right now in the medicine. For example, the effect of color. The first study was actually from the beginning of 1900s uh, when white chocolate was invented. And they wanted to see the influence of the color of white in chocolate in a consumer-based investigation. So it's not necessary to reinvent the wheel. Perhaps we have lots to learn from the marketing as well when we think about the expectations. Yes. Stephanie? All right. Thanks, Edith. I feel like a glass of wine now, I have to say. <laughs> I'm wondering, because I know you like to drink wine as a hobby, have you ever tried any of these studies on yourself actually at home? <laughs> Well, <laughs> that is an ongoing discussion at home. We didn't dare till now to dye our vines because I, I am very afraid of the results. <laughs> Actually, the studies show that the experts are more prone to, prone to be affected by the color of the vine because they have more expectations in comparison to the lay population. So there you see the effect of previous experiences as well. You have much more expectations toward the color. So we didn't dare it till now. But I put actually a link, oh, oh I cannot go sorry. back to my slides. Uh, I put actually a link by the sound seasoning uh, they put at the research, um, at the paper of Dr. Spence in Oxford University, some music types, in, so that you can experiment yourself at home with the music, if you can enhance your tasting experience, and I'm planning to do it at home now. <laughs> Christian. Yeah. It's on, yeah. So, uh, very interesting. And I've heard, so, and I'd like to get your opinion on that, that most of the sommeliers and wine experts are actually quite bad because test retest seems to be incredibly poor in big wine tastings. And only a few people seem to be really consistent tasting identical wines in a long row and basically giving the exact sort of notes and things like that. So that brings me to the idea of the Bayesian idea of, of sort of uh, perception, namely that if you have a very weak or very bad precision of what's coming in, then you're very prone to obviously contextual effects. Is, is that true that these sommeliers are really not as good as we think they are? Well, the studies show some differences between experts and lay population. Actually, um, for example, for dyeing the white wine, 
Master of Wines detect the difference already, so they say there's something fishy there, but it's still not at the level that you say, okay, it's definitely a white wine. So I, I understand what you say, the contextual factors have a very big impact on our tasting experience, and it's normal that it's, it's the case, because our ancestors, we, when you look from an evol evolutionary perspective, we were fruit eaters in the nature, and the color was actually very important for us. Red means actually ripeness of the uh, fruit, and when you compare red and green, which I find most intriguing, because in the pain experiments, red always is the danger, but when you look at the, from the taste perspective, it's, it means much more pleasantness, much more ripeness, and it's normal that it has a substantial effect. Okay, thanks, Elif. <laughs> So we have two slams left. I hope everybody's still with me. While we're already on the topic of substance use, drugs, let's just stay with that for a while. Uh, the next slammer is Philip Hurst from Canterbury Christ Church University, and he's going to talk about placebo effects and what they have to do with performance-enhancing substances in sports. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, how do I go on mine? I have some slides? Yeah, perfect. So, drug use in sports. I can imagine we may be familiar with some athletes who've doped, used drugs to enhance their performance, when you can consider Ben Johnson, Maria Sharapova, Lance Armstrong. It's pretty rife. Year on year, you normally get an athlete that comes out who known to have taken a drug to improve their performance. Drugs or socially, uh, sort of, you're banned if you use them, or certain drugs, you'd be banned from sport for four years, and they can also have some severe health consequences with it. But you then question, why do athletes continue to take them even though there are all these consequences? So I want to talk about that in my presentation today, to discuss why athletes are taking drugs and what may encourage their substance use behaviours. So I brought some amazing performance-enhancing drugs with me today. Nice, big and wet, rare red-white pills. And what this drug does is that it can significantly improve strength and balance. Now I would like a volunteer to come up to take my drug so I can demonstrate its effectiveness. Any volunteers? <laughs> yeah, come on then, the psychedelic man, let's go. <laughs> Okay, so while I pour a glass of water, there we go. How are we doing? Yeah, all right. Good. <laughs> okay, wait there. So, we're going to do a bit of a baseline testing. So, I've got a test for us to do, and we're going to see your baseline to see how it is. So, I'd like you to stand facing the room, one leg up, stand up. If you just come back forward for me, thank you very much. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to push down on your arm. You're balancing all right. And I want you to try and balance as best as you can. We ready? Okay, and we go. Okay, That's a, we'll have a, a test. One more time, one more time. Here we go, here we go. That was good, but not too bad. Okay, so potentially some improvement there. Let's find out then if we can take our new drug. If you'd like to take one of those. Here we go. Just one? Just one drug, is, if you don't want to overdose. All right. We're all right with that. <laughs> Take your drug, are you feeling stronger? It's a, it's a very potent drug. Immediately, as soon as it's in your mouth, you're feeling the effects. It has already kicked in. So let's demonstrate it again, our balance test, to see if this improves. Okay, we ready? I'm gonna do exactly the same. I mean, does that feel any different? <laughs> yeah. One more time, wanna do one more time? Let's try it, let's go. <laughs> one more, same again. I mean, wow, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Actually, on that note, on that note. So, imagine you were an athlete. I mean, if I was to say, would you like some more of these drugs? Yeah. You'd say, yeah? <laughs> okay, <but> perfect. <laughs> thank you very much. Round of applause, thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you about it if you wanna, we can go to the pub, I can't remember to say, and I can talk you through what exactly happened there, but um, essentially, I haven't given a drug out. I've given a placebo out. And athletes who take drugs expect them to improve performance. 
And it's that expectation that sometimes is really encouraging substance use behavior. Even though evidence for a lot of performance enhancing drugs out there is very, very weak. There's no real randomized controlled trials to really show its efficacy under ideal conditions. And what we know, or what we often find, is that a lot of these drugs are subjected to the placebo effect. So you can kind of argue then, is it the placebo effect that is encouraging substance use behaviors in sport, which then suggests to international organizations like the World Anti-Doping Agency, or we, do we need to educate athletes about the placebo effect to highlight the power of the mind in their effectiveness of performance and substances to potentially prevent it from happening? And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions for Philip? Over there, Andrea. Yes, thank you so much. Nice experiment. Um, <laughs> what was the effect of the open label character of this experiment? Was it important or not? Um, I think it's going to augment it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I completely falsified everything that I did there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it seemed to me he was quite convinced. Even he knew, of course. Uh, yeah, so the trick is, instead of pushing downwards on my first one, <laughs> downwards and to left, I push downwards and to the right. And then you're able to balance a little bit easier. Um, I was foul of that myself as an athlete. I actually bought, it was a, a balance band, and they would do those types of tricks to show off the amazing power of these balance bands, even though it's just complete false, false fine. So yeah. <laughs> Another question? Okay, then I think a Thank big round much. of applause is everything that's left. <laughs> Thank you. So the last slam is coming up. Um, I hope you haven't picked your favorite yet because there's still one person to go. And now we come to something very serious. I don't know if you know this, but it is the peak of allergy season. Some of you might not be sniffing now, but once you go outside, it's gonna go mayhem. So, what would you say if I told you that you can just use classical conditioning? I think Stephanie Hölzen from the University Hospital Essen can tell you more about it. Great. Thanks, Helena. <laughs> okay, let's figure out this device. All right. I'm going to stick a bit with the drugs, but go to legal ones. <laughs> um, so, hi, everyone. I hope you still have some energy left so late in the evening. The title of my talk is Itching for Science, Modeling Anti-Allergic Placebo Effects in the Healthy Crowd. And in this case, the one itching for science was actually me, because just for you, I became my own study participant. So let's dive right in. Ah, okay. This is my arm. And today I want to tell you, one, why my arm looks like that. <laughs> And two, what I might do to prevent it from looking like that. So my arm suffered from what is called a prick test. Sounds gruesome, but it's actually a pretty common diagnostic instrument in the allergy clinic. All of you who feel a slight shudder at this cute picture probably know what I'm talking about. As Helena said, it's the peak of the allergy season. But what exactly is that prick test? Well. I brought you a little recipe, so you can practically cook up your own prick test. What you need for it are, one, an arm, which I provided. Then, of course, you need competent personnel, like our MD student center. You need a lancet. OK, maybe not that big, please. Yeah, OK, that's more like it. And then you need a test substance to drop onto the skin. We used histamine for that, which is nice because it works in anyone, even in those people who do not have a problem with pollen and all that other stuff. You drop your test substance onto the skin, and then you use your lancet to prick into the outer layer of the skin to introduce your test substance into the skin. So, check, easy as pie, right? And then what happens to the skin is this, or in easier terms, this. Or in even easier terms, this. Um, yeah, but 
You're probably wondering why I'm telling you all this at a placebo conference. Bear with me, because as you might remember, in part two, I wanted to tell you how I could prevent my arm from looking like that. I guess you're all familiar with the principle of classical conditioning and Pavlov's experiments with dogs. They presented food together with a tone, and after a while, the dogs would come to associate the food with the tone, leading them to salivate upon hearing the tone alone. So the dog's salivation became a conditioned response, with the tone as its conditioned stimulus. We did the same, basically, just that I was the dog. <laughs> and instead of steak and bell, I got some antihistaminergic medication together with a novel taste stimulus, this fancy green drink here. After coupling those two for a while, the drink alone would elicit those effects we would normally expect to see with a drug. So that means that we would see a reduction of the itch and also a reduction of those skin bubbles. At least, that's the idea. I haven't fully analyzed the data yet, to be honest. So, you have to be a bit more patient for the results. But, yeah, why is this research actually important and not just a nice excuse to take funny pictures in the dermatology ward? Well, to illustrate that point, I've brought you this image. People often have to take heaps of medication to modulate their immune system, be it for their allergies, or, for example, after taking a liver uh, getting a liver transplant. Using classical conditioning could offer us a way for people to... <laughs> could offer us a way to reduce the dosages necessary for people to fight their diseases. And with that, I would like to thank some great people and also you for listening so late in the evening. Any questions for Stephanie? I just have a question if you are currently running any studies where allergy prone people can come and take part, and if yes, where and when? Yeah, sorry, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we wanted to see whether we can actually do this in healthy people to have a bit of a more easy model. Also, because, yeah, finding patients always is more difficult than mm -hmm. finding healthy people. So, that's why we included, well, healthy people here. Um, we, yeah. <laughs> but later you also want to go towards I will patients. let you know. It sounds like you're interested. <laughs> in case we do, I'll let you know. <laughs> Perfect. So you know where to sign up in case that ever happens. Thank you, Steffi. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. <laughs> now, while I wait for the technical people to come to the slide. So now comes the time where you all get out your phones, scan this QR code, or just go to this link here and vote for your favorite science slammer. So we have a short form where you just vote for your favorite one, just one, and then we will see uh, the top three slammers, and those will be presented um, on Saturday in the closing ceremony. While you do that, I just need one more thing to say. I hope that with this session, which was actually really dear to my heart, and I'm so happy that uh, because we were able to organize this conference, we could include such an event, uh, that this will start a tradition for the SIPS conference to include a science slam and uh, amazing people who are doing amazing work communicating their work to people who have no idea about it. Thanks so much. <laughs>